أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين الغرر الميامين سيما بقية الله في الأرضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين سيدنا وإمام زماننا وولي نعمتنا مهدي هذه الأمة وطاووس أهل الجنة الحجة ابن الحسن العسكري فداه وارواح العالمين اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلها برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين. For the hastening of the reappearance of the Master, the Savior, the Avenger, recite aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Two important characteristics every successor has to have. I know I'm kind of skimming through all of these. These are very in depth discussions that require lengthy discourse, but I just want to uh, make sure that people have enough so as to develop a solid set of beliefs. Two characteristics that these prophets have to have. Number one, they have to be the most knowledgeable. Is that too hard to accept? Is that too hard to believe? I have gone in depth as to the requirements of the Khalifa according to the Sunni school in the Fatimiyya lecture series of last year. Not this year, but the previous one. Um, but in a nutshell, our belief is that they have to be superior in terms of their knowledge, at the very least, at the very least. We could talk about bravery, we could talk about uh, their uh, uh, perhaps conduct with other people and akhlaq, we could talk about all these things. But at the very least, they have to be superior in their knowledge. Why? Number one, because someone who is inferior shouldn't be in a position of leading others who are superior. I mean, it goes without saying. It's the most basic logic. Plus, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, Who is supposed to be the leader and the follower? Allah says, the one who guides to the truth. Is he not more worthy of being followed? Or the one who cannot guide until he himself is guided. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, what's wrong with you? Can't you understand this? Can't you fathom this? This is basic logic. The one who is superior in his knowledge should guide everyone who is inferior to them. The others tell us that no, that's not necessarily the case. He doesn't have to be the most knowledgeable. Sure, it took him seven years to memorize a surah in the Holy Quran. But what's wrong with that, right? There are other people who memorize the Quran. Sure, he had to call on to Amir al muminin multiple times and say, La abqani Allah limu'dhalatin lastalaha abal hasan. May I never live to see the day when I have a problem and you're not there to help me, ya Amir al muminin Well, if Amir al muminin is the one guiding you, if he's the one teaching you, shouldn't you get off that pulpit and let Amir al muminin sit instead? Again, basic rationality and logic. So, the Imam has to have knowledge that is superior to everyone else. So that's comparative knowledge. Number two, he has to know everything about religion. Everything about the Quran. So the minute a Khalifa says, I don't know the meaning of this verse, وَفَاكِهَةً وَأَبَّا They said to him, what is وَأَبَّا? We understand that Allah says that we have given you fruits and Abba. But what, what's the meaning of this? He said, you will not be asked about this on the day of judgment. Get away from me. He doesn't know the answer. So he says, no one should know the answer. The minute the Khalifa says, I don't know the meaning of this verse, I don't understand the application of that verse, that Khalifa is automatically disqualified. Why? Because the Khalifa of Rasulullah should know everything about the Quran, should know everything about religion. Otherwise, what's the point? His position isn't just the position of an executive office where he appoints the chief of police and he appoints the head of the border force and he appoints someone to be the minister of education. It's not that. The ultimate job of the successor of Rasulullah is to guide people and teach them matters of religion. So that's the first feature that the Khalifa has to have. And we have plenty of evidence. It's an undisputed fact that Ali ibn Abi Talib, <clears throat> that the Ahlul Bayt السلام, were not only superior to everyone else, it's a shame that we even have to compare them to others or put the names of others in the same sentence as any member of the Ahlul Bayt, the household of purity and infallibility of Rasulullah. Not just that, but also they had knowledge of the Quran in its entirety and all of its multiple layers. The most basic proof that can be presented in this regard is the Holy Prophet's statement in Nitarikun Fikumul Thaqalain Kitab Allah wa Itrati Ahla Bayti wa in Nahuma Layyaftariqa Hatta Yarida Alayya al Hawd. They will never separate until they reach me by the pond of Kotha. If the Ahlul Bayt had any lack or deficiency in their knowledge of the Quran, they would be separated from it. The fact that they're never separated means that they have complete dominance and understanding of the knowledge and science of the Quran. That's just one proof so you can have something to take home with you, inshallah. The second thing that a successor has to have is to be infallible. Again, the slightest mistake, the slightest error, the slightest act of sin or transgression and this person becomes automatically disqualified. Because how, he, how can he be a guide? How he, can he be a leader? If he is someone who is prone to mistakes, he has to be inerrant, he has to be free from sins. And multiple verses in the Quran and traditions of the Ahlul Bayt go to prove that this applied to none other than the family of Rasulullah. No one else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayat al tathir proves unequivocally that the Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam innama yuridu Allah liyudhiba ankum al-rijsa ahl al-bayt wa yutahhirakum tathira Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala verily, surely, absolutely there are five instances where Allah emphasizes this point the points of emphasis are absolutely incredible which just go to prove the conclusion that this is a serious matter. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not just saying this. Innama 
Allah only and surely yuridu innama yuridu Allah li this lam is a point of emphasis li yudhhiba ankum ar-rijsa ahl al-bayt wa yutahhirakum tathira again point of emphasis all of this to mean what that he wants to purify you from physical impurities that your body will never touch. We're talking about impurities, right? Allah wants to purify the Ahl Bayt from impurities. What are these impurities? That your bodies will never touch a stain of blood? That your bodies will never come in contact with any physical impurity? Absolutely not. This is something that's natural. Everybody comes in contact with physical impurities. So the impurities we're talking about are spiritual impurities, meaning sins transgressions Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to purify you in the most thorough purification so the Imam has to be infallible nobody even bothers to claim that the first three Khulafa were infallible no one even tries that because their rap sheet is so long it's like how do you even try forget it let's not even go there let's try and eliminate infallibility as a condition that's what they'll do no one, so the same people tell you that this verse was revealed about the wives of the Prophet. Which of the wives of the Prophet? Even at a time when they were at war with Amirul Mu'mineen, when did she come and say, Do you remember when Allah said about me, No. Which of the wives of the Prophet ever claimed that they were infallible? None. And so, again, clear cut unambiguous, unequivocal, absolutely crystal clear. Even if someone was good and moral and didn't commit any acts of sin, how do you know what goes on in their private lives? Sometimes we'll be sitting together, and there's a group of people, you might see someone that you look up to, that you respect because you see them as being incredibly pious and muttaqi and so forth. Can you unequivocally and without any doubt claim that that person doesn't commit sins? Obviously, he's not committing any sins in public, but that he or she doesn't commit any sins in private? Of course not. How do you know? You just don't have knowledge about that. Number two, if someone happened to be infallible at some point in their lives, how do you know what's going to happen to them in the future? How do you know whether they'll remain pure when they come to power, when they sit on that throne and they begin to write executive statements and their word becomes the means with which others are killed. Their tongue becomes sharper than a sword. How do you know that when they reach that position, they'll maintain any sense of perceived purity that they might have? How do you know that? I'll give you a couple of examples. Abdul Malik ibn Marwan was someone who used to spend the majority of his time in the masjid. Subhanallah. He's reciting the Quran. He's worshiping Allah. He's praying, prostrating, bowing down, doing all these great things. Until they came to him and said that your father has died and now it's your turn to become the Khalifa. He closed the Quran and he said, see you later. And it got to a point, they even say that when he was you know, in his pious phase, that he would walk in a manner so as to avoid on, on, on putting his foot on ants. He's so compassionate, he's like a proper tree hugger hipster type of person. Where he's like, oh nature, the environment, let's not kill any ants. And it got to a point where as Zahri or as Zuhari, who was his advisor, says, that I went to him one day and I said, look, there are rumors, your majesty, that the Khalifa drinks alcohol. Just tell me that you don't so I can go out and say the Khalifa himself spoke to me and said, absolutely not. What are these rumors? Have shame. What are you talking about? Marwan Abdul Malik said to him, well, not only do I drink alcohol, I drink fresh blood. And I do so in the holy month of Ramadan. Are you kidding me? I don't drink wine. Of course I do. I even drink fresh blood. 
I bring a hundred Alawi Shia every night, have them slaughtered, and that I drink from their blood. And you're telling me you're trying to protect my reputation? Who cares about my reputation? Who cares about what other people think? I'm the king, I get to do whatever I want. Another example, Abu Muslim al-Khurasani. I don't know if you've heard that name. But he was an individual who was from Khurasan around the time of Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. He came out and rose against the Khulafa of Bani Umayyah. At the time, the last Khalifa of Bani Umayyah was a man by the name of Marwan ibn Muhammad ibn Marwan ibn al-Hakam. He was called Marwan al-Himar, Marwan the donkey, right? He was nothing but a pile of carnal desires waiting to be satisfied. All he cared about was wine and women and that sort of stuff. Couldn't care less about anything else. And so the Umayyad empire became so weak and fragile during his reign that Abu Muslim al-Khurasani saw an opportunity. What did he do? He rose against him in Khurasan. In order to mobilize people to come and join you in your campaign against the central government, you need to speak to them in their own language. So how did he mobilize people? He said, my motto is Ya Litharat al Hussein." I want to avenge the killing of Abba Abdullah al-Hussein. Bani Umayyah killed the Imam. Let's all go together and fight the Umayyads and restore justice for the Ahlul Bayt The Imams of the Ahlul Bayt warned people, don't be deceived by this guy. Don't believe what he says. But people are naive. Sometimes all we want to see is someone who's called a sheikh or a sayyid. And that's it. We'll listen to what he has to say. We will follow him. We will become super fans because he's got a sheikh title or a sayyid title. Because he might be wearing a turban. Because he might give the appearance of someone who's religious. People are naive. Many people are sadly, unfortunately, simply stupid. They fall for appearances and they end up making big blunders in their lives. Ya Latharat al Hussein! People flocked toward him. They rose against the Khalifa of the day. Then, once the Umayyads were toppled, who became the successors? Who became the people who inherited that government thanks to Abu Muslim al-Khurasani? It was Abu al-Abbas al-Saffah and Mansur al-Dawaniqi and the Abbasid dynasty rose and ruled over the Muslim nation for the next six or seven hundred years thanks to this man. Someone came to Imam Rida alayhi salam. He said to him, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, what do you think about Abu Muslim al-Khurasani, this great warrior, restorer of justice for Abu Abdullah al Hussein?" The Imam said to him, he is written in the list of our enemies. In other words, we have two lists. إِنَّهُ فِي دِيْوَانِ أَعْدَائِنَا He said to the Imam, but people say he was a Shia. And that's another thing. A lot of times people fall prey to the title Shia. Oh, but he's a Shia. Oh, oh I know he's doing this and that, and he's, he's all over the place in terms of his beliefs, in terms of his actions, in terms of everything he says, but he's still a Shia. He said to the Imam, imam they say that he was, he was a Shia. The Imam said, Kadabu Allah. By God, they're liars. How, how could he be a Shia? Then the Imam said this. He said, that if you love us, then you have to disassociate from him. And you cannot combine your allegiance and your love towards us with allegiance and love towards Abu Muslim al-Khurasani. I'll give you just one example of who this man is and what he did. Al-Muqaddas al-Ardabili in his book, Hadiqat al-Shia, says that Abu Muslim al-Khurasani caused the deaths of 600,000 people. 600,000. All under the banner of Ya Litharat al Hussein. There are many other examples of how people were one thing and it turned out that they were completely different. But I want to mention this hadith to you. Someone wrote to Imam al Zaman. He said to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, uh, Ya Hujjat Allah, why can't people choose their Imam for themselves? Because again, the other school has a completely arbitrary mechanism, right? 
Who gets to choose the Khalifa? Is it one person as the first Khalifa chose the second? He appointed him. Or is it a council of people? How many people should be in that council? What qualities should the members of that council have? Nothing, there's nothing. The process, the procedure is so haphazard, it makes no sense. You'd think that Rasulullah, if he wanted this system to be implemented, that he would have left some instructions, even if it's like vague instructions, other than them saying that, oh, Rasulullah allowed him to lead Salat al Jama'ah. <clears throat> Salat al Jama'ah, that's it. What about all the things that happened later on? The, third, the second Khalifa then picks a council of six people. He says, the six have to choose my successor, right? And then he says that if the council was split into two, so you had three on one side and three on the other side, see which side has Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, then kill the other three. Based on what? Where are you coming up with this garbage from? Other than from your back pocket. Where? No process, nothing. Then the third Khalifa gets killed. Everyone flocks to Amir al muminin And they say there is no one else that can do this but you, Ya Ali ibn Abi Talib. Then Amir al muminin is killed. People go to Muawiyah. Then from Muawiyah, they go to Yazid. From Yazid, they go. Based on what exactly? Anyway, he says to the Imam, why can't we pick the Khalifa ourselves? In other words, why can't a group of really wise people, let's say for example, for argument's sake, a group of top-ranking ulama getting together and saying that this person shall be our leader and he shall represent the Holy Prophet. The Imam said, read the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Musa and says that Musa chose 70 rajulan from his people. Essentially, the story in a nutshell is that Musa came from the mount. He told people that God spoke to me. When God speaks to me, what that means is Allah creates the sounds that Musa can understand. It's not the voice of God per se, but Allah creates the sound waves. That's a, a simplified uh, description of it. So Musa says, Allah spoke to me. The Israelites said to them, well, you look like you're someone who's really proud of their achievement, but... How do we believe you? So you have to take us so that we could hear the voice of God directly. Fair suggestion? I don't know. It's up to you. They said, in order to believe in what you say, we have to hear God speak. So Musa says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what do I do? Allah says, fine. Do this. You have 700,000 Israelites. Filter them out. Create a short list. Find the best among the 700,000, bring the shortlist down to 70,000. Then from 70,000, pick the best among them and reduce the number down to 7,000. And from 7,000, choose the best 700. And from the 700, so you see how many filtering uh, states they went through? From 700,000 all the way to 70. Pick the best of the best the highest, the most moral, the most truthful, the most knowledgeable of the 700,000 tribes of Israel, or members of the tribes rather, take those, bring them to the mount. Musa took them to the mount so they could be the witnesses and go back to, to their people and say that we heard God speak to Musa. When they came, the hadith says, Imam al-Zaman says, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to them, it was different from any other voice they had heard. Because the voice came from six different directions. Allahu Akbar. So they know that this is not just a human speaking to them. Someone pretending to be God. They heard the voice from six different directions. After that, وَإِذْ قُلْتُمْ Allah says in the Quran, يَا مُوسَىٰ لَن نُؤْمِنَ لَكَ حَتَّىٰ نَرَ اللَّهَ جَهْرًا Oh Musa, sure we heard the voice of God. But that's not going to cut it. It's not enough. We won't believe you until we see God Himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, at that point, I will send down my chastisement upon you. They all died. They all died. Having disbelieved after all of this, Imam al Zaman says to this person, he says to him, Musa was a prophet. He was infallible. He was among Ulil Azm, one of the top messengers of Allah. 
He filtered his people all the way down from 700,000 to 70, and yet he couldn't pick the ones who were good. How can you do that? How can you pick someone who's qualified? How would you know whether this person's good or not, whether he's knowledgeable or not, whether he's going to remain good or not? <clears throat> Other than Amir al Mu'mineen, he was sitting in his house, in his little hut, sewing his broken old sandals. Ibn Abbas came to him. He said, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, you've just become the Khalifa. You have delegations from lands far and wide. They've all come to see you, to give you their Pledge of Allegiance, and you're sitting here sewing your sandals. The Imam looked at Ibn Abbas. He said, You see these sandals? This one? Single sandal, not even the pair. He said, yes. He said, this is worth to me than your khilafah. Ali ibn Abi Talib, when he became a khalifa, was the same person who was dragged from his home to the masjid, being forced to give his allegiance to that false, self-proclaimed khalifa. Ali ibn Abi Talib doesn't change. Why? Because it's appointed by Allah <coughs> subhanahu Ta'ala. Usayyid ibn Khudayr was someone who was holding the reins of the Prophet's camel on his way back from Uhud. He says, he was a good man, he says, I was holding the reins of the camel. We would go when the Prophet entered Medina, every district he went to, because that district had people who were killed in battle, in the Battle of Uhud, when they realized that their friend, their family member, their relative, their son, their father had been killed, they would all cry for him, they would mourn for him. The Muslims lost 70 people in the Battle of Uhud. So every district was crying for their martyr. Usayyid ibn Khudayr says that I heard Rasulullah murmur something. I listened carefully, I heard him say, as for my uncle Hamza, he has no one to cry for him. So Usaid ran to the leaders of his own tribe, Al Aus, as well as the other people in Medina. He said, Rasulullah is saying, No one is mourning my uncle. So they all came out and, and they mourned Hamza Sayyidu Shuhada. This was Usaid ibn Khadayr. On another occasion, a member of his own tribe who was a disbeliever threatened to kill Rasulullah. He came to the Prophet. He said, Ya Rasulullah, even though he's a member of my tribe, let me go kill him. He was a good man. And yet, Usaid ibn Khudayr was one of the people in the masjid of Rasulullah when they came and said that Ali ibn Abi Talib refuses to come and give his pledge of allegiance to the Khalifa. Usaid was the first person who said, O oh, Khalifa, let me go and drag Ali to the masjid. People change. People change all the time. How can you tell whether this person's going to stay the same? Usama ibn Zayd, Rasulullah, sent him as the leader of a contingency. When he was dying, the Holy Prophet said, <coughs> He said, man an Usama. Didn't he? Whoever doesn't join the army of Osama, may Allah curse him so that everyone would leave the city of Medina. And when the Prophet passes away, that there would be no one to conspire against his family. Right? That's Osama. And yet, 25 years later, when Amir al Mu'mineen became the Khalifa, one of the seven or nine people who refused to give bay'ah to Amir al Mu'mineen was Osama ibn Zayd. People change. The Khulafa, they, uh, the English say, they bigged him up. They kept pumping him. They kept telling him that you are a special man. Rasulullah chose you and whatnot. So they brought him close to them. Anyway, it's Thursday night. This haphazard, chaotic Khilafa system led to Uthman. Uthman appointed Muawiyah. Muawiyah gave birth to Yazid. Yazid was such an immoral character. So immoral. There are things about him I can't even mention on the pulpit. Suffice to say that he had this pet monkey. He would take 
and accompany the monkey with him on his expeditions, when he went on hunting trips, and he would have him sit on the pulpit of Rasulullah every time he spoke. It led to Yazid, which tells you that this entire process was so flawed. And it led to the daughters of Rasulullah being paraded in the palace of Yazid ibn Muawiyah, who was petting his monkey pet right next to him. Banatu Ziyan, Banatu Ziyadin, Fil Qusuri Masunatun. As the poet says, but as for the daughters of Rasulullah, Fil Falawati, the daughters of the Holy Prophet are running in the desert because these savages were trying to hunt them down, to loot them, to kill them. When Lady Zainab, a night like this, we have to go to Karbala. Bi'abi anta wa ummi ya Aba Abdullah. Tonight Fatima al-Zahra is in Karbala. Tonight Amir al-Mu'mineen is in Karbala. Rasulullah is there. The traditions tell us that every prophet of God visits Aba Abdullah on Thursday night, Lady Zainab stood up, looking at the butchered body of her brother Aba Abdullah. فَقَالَتْ كَلِمَةً أَبْكَتِ الْعَدُوَّ وَالصَّدِيقِ She made a statement that made everyone cry, including the enemy forces. <coughs> What did she say? She looked at the body of Abba Abdullah and said, Anta akhi. Anta ibn walidi. Are you my brother? Are you the son of my father?